capital markets and risk management are proud to host a name that needs no recognition founder and ceo of zerodha and rain matter nitin kamath Nitin bootstrapped and founded Zerodha in 2010 to overcome the hurdles he faced during his decade-long stint as a trader. Over the last decade, Zerodha has changed the landscape of the Indian broking industry. With over 10 million clients and contributing to over 18% of the exchange retail trading volumes, Zerodha is the largest stock broker in India today. Nitin also started Rain Matter, a R&D fintech incubator. and fund that has partnered with some of the best investment tech startups in india more recently nitin has also set up the rain matter climate foundation an indian climate fund providing funding to startups and grassroots organizations working on solutions to mitigate climate change nitin is also a part of secondary market advisory committee and market data advisory committee with sebi Outside of work, he enjoys spending time with his family, playing guitar, poker, basketball, and swimming. We welcome you, sir. Also with him, we have our professor Venkatesh Panchpagesan, commonly known as our Professor Venki. A brief intro about him: He is an associate professor of finance with more than twenty years of experience in academia and in global financial services industry. After finishing his PhD in finance from the University of Southern California, he is chairperson of NSR CEL at IIM Bangalore, a leading incubation center for startups, emerging business, and women entrepreneurs in India. Besides, he also heads real real estate research initiative at IIM Bangalore. Prior to joining IM Bangalore in September 2011 he was with the world's largest hedge fund Bridgewater Associates in India he is certified as a chartered accountant and a cost accountant and holds a post graduate management degree from IIM Calcutta as well over to Venki sir now thank thank you Vaishali and uh, welcome to all of you um this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to uh, here one of the cult figures um the reason i say cult is every time he comes to imb you know the, the stadium is full the auditorium is full and the last time he came he was part of our uh, nsr cell startup uh, related uh, event uh, but i'm extremely excited to have uh, nitin with us um we've got about an hour to spend with him um so my role is largely to stay in the background and let nitin do most of the talking um a couple of house rules um i want this to be interactive so please uh, think about questions that you want to ask him secondly let's focus on the man and his mission let's not ask him about where the stock market is headed or <laughs> which stocks to buy or sell so uh, let's keep it that way and the third thing is this is not a Uh, a gd or a, a class participation thing so please share your questions uh, let others also ask okay so let's keep that way so i'm going to start with a few things with nitin and then we'll set the ball rolling okay um so nitin so i want to uh, start by going back in time so imagine uh, for all of you you don't know zerodha came into existence in 2010 right somewhere so this is sort of post gfc um so i want to go back and look at the younger nitin and and uh, nikhil and say okay what got you attracted to the stock markets or financial markets and then from there how did this journey of starting something like a uh, zerodha happen so just walk us through your yeah no thanks thanks for having me here uh, yeah if if you would ask me what stock where markets going i've done this for 25 years i have no clue you know so <laughs> a short answer <laughs> yeah so uh yeah i i mean the the so i've lived most of my life in south bangalore so i've you know i don't know how many times i've uh, crossed imb uh, I, i started with my first office down this road you know about the vodafone store uh, in i think 2004 2005 uh so yeah so a much younger nitin always hoped that somehow i'll be able to make to imb <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh yeah but uh i started trading early and uh, i think i've always had the you know the kida of 
trying to share knowledge. So I was very active uh, right from 2001, 2002. Uh, you know, I had some of the largest Yahoo Messenger groups on trading and markets. Uh, I was also very active in a lot of these online trading communities. You know, it was Trader G, Indie Traders, and a bunch of them, and Orkut. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so in 2007 is when Nikhil, the younger brother joined me and, uh, he was a better trader than I was. And, uh, around 2009, 10 is when the question was asked saying, you know, if he's a better trader, why am I sitting and trading? You know, why, why can't he continue trading? And, um, I tried to solve for this problem, which is, you know, which is, uh, because I was so connected to this whole communities uh, online, you know, I thought, you know, there's a there's an opportunity to be a better broker uh, for very active traders. You know, Zeroda is not what it is today, right? When we started off Zeroda, the idea was uh, there are, you know, like this very active day traders, FNO traders, and they needed a platform, no frills, uh, transparent, and at very low cost, right? That was really the problem that we were trying to solve. And, um, uh, and yeah, and, and, the, and the reason we got enabled you know, I mean, see, the thing is, being a stockbroker isn't, you know, at least today sounds a lot more easier than what it sounded in 2009-10. Now, I think there are two things that enabled the idea. One was the National Stock Exchange gave, gave out a free trading platform uh, if you wanted to become a broker. It was called NSE Now. Uh, so I think I was one of the first few guys to spot an arbitrage opportunity saying, if tech is coming for free, is there a way to disrupt pricing? Right, so that's really how Zeroda started. Because otherwise, if we had to go invest in uh, technology and platform, etc., uh, right at when we started the business, there was it, it was impossible to actually build Zeroda out. You know, we would not have existed. So that arbitrage opportunity is what led to starting Zeroda. I mean, um, see, in a broking business, there are two things that you need: you need a trading platform where your customers trade, and you need a back office platform where you process your trades, send out your contract notes, maintain your ledger, etc. Um, so, uh, so I went to this Chennai based vendor, uh, who gave it to me for free. And he said, you know, I said, I'll beta test for you. He was launching his own product. Um, uh, so we started Zeroda really with, I think four lakh rupees, you know, um, uh, of course, you know, you had to give exchange deposits to become a stockbroker in India. You have to give a deposit of 90 lakhs or something. If you're a partnership firm and one and a half close, if you're a private limited, um, we, we, we started with actually 90 lakh rupees and we were a partnership firm till 2017, 18 because there was not enough money on the table to become a private limited firm, you know? So, uh, so yeah, so that was a refundable deposit exchange waivers of uh, membership fees. And, uh, we, you know, we went to this web designer, you know, who put a simple website and, uh, yeah, the whole thing actually, and I already had an office on this Vodafone store and I bought a Vodafone store, uh, where I used to be a franchisee of a bigger broker, you know? Um, so yeah, it was kind of, you know, I mean, that, that was really the opportunity we spotted. And, uh, so yeah, Nikhil continued trading and, uh, I, you know, I, I said, you know, I'll give a shot at building the broking business. One of the reasons the first two, one, two years, we didn't have to raise money was because Nikhil was trading, uh, you know, this is something, <laughs> you know, because he was generating trading profits because, uh, and that's how we survived the first one, one and a half years without having to go and raise more capital. The thing is, um, I mean, I've talked to a few people uh, who had tried starting a brokerage business and usually this is a business where, you know, unlike a traditional startups, I mean, I've been engaged with startups for the last three and a half, four years. And uh, I mean, people start up in all sorts of things, right? Like food or, or clothing. And, but in a brokerage, it's highly regulated because one of the things that startups don't like is too many, too much regulations hindering you, right? Because at the early stage, you just cannot afford that regulatory cost. So how did that manage. I mean, in the sense, this is something, yes, you found a good technology, but then going forward, there's a huge regulatory cost onto it. So how did that? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I think um, this whole regulatory fear is, I think, overstated. You know, I mean, like when 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 I first thought that we, we had to become a broker, the first thing I did was reach out to my friends who were, you know, who were brokers. And I was a sub broker with a larger broker. So I knew folks and everyone said, you know, SEBI will eat you up. Exchanges will eat you up, you know, I mean, then government's going to come after you. Not once has it happened in the last 11, 12 years. You know I mean? Um, I think, I think this whole, I think, I think it, it depends on how you look at the business because a lot of startups today are, you know, kind of trying to work in regulatory grace, right. To build modes. And if you're trying to do that, then, 
I mean, I, I don't think India is the right place to be even building a business, right? Because, um, you know, because, you know, especially, you know, with SEBI and RBI, they're, you know, they're, the regulations are very explicit. You can either do it or not do it. Now, if you kind of work in that area where they've said explicitly you can't do it or they have not defined it, I think whatever you do, I think you have to do it in the spirit of regulations. If regulation existed, uh, what would we have done? And and this is something I've been very cognizant right from the day one, which is we have never once pushed regulatory boundaries. I mean, we have done some things, you know, which is potentially gray, light gray of sorts, but but we've done it in such a way that that you know, if regulation existed for it, it would be in the spirit of the regulation, right? So I think you know you need to have a regulatory foresight as well to build a business in a regulated industry, right? You know, say that how will regulations change in the future and kind of build your business for that. I think over the last five to 10 years, uh, every single thing that we've done, we've been like, you know, every new product we've done, every new thing, you know, we've built as a business or every startup we have supported as a business, you know, it's always kept in mind saying, are they breaking any regulations? If they're breaking, I'm not, I'm not going to be, you know, like hundred meters near them. Right. And, if they're not breaking the regulation, if they're doing something which is gray, you know, would regulator have an issue with it, right? So, um, so it's kind of worked out very well. I mean, I think I'm the only guy from the industry, right, to, today, being on like like a bunch of SEBI advisory committees. You know, like you know, otherwise, you know, SEBI looks at brokers almost like you know, <laughs> don't you know, keep them away types. You know, so we. Uh, just being like that, you know, has helped us. Uh, so I, I don't think I don't think there's anything to fear about regulators. I think the incumbents react to you because you're a new kid on the block, and this is a well-protected business, right? So it's sort of I'm assuming a lot of uh, thing were thrown at you when you started. How did that? Work? Yeah, I mean, so the thing is, we got lucky so many times in this journey. I mean, one of the lucky lucky things happened was starting in 2010. Because a lot of existing incumbents, you know, they, they were trying to diversify the business. Because 2009, 10 was really the worst year. I mean, nine was okay. Actually, 2010 was really the worst year for broking as an ind industry historically. Because you know, you know, when the when there's volatility in the market, brokers do well, right? So 2008 was actually a good year in terms of money. You know, how much revenue and profits brokers made. 2010 was when you know it was really, really horrible. So everyone, you know, IFL was doing well. The Indians was doing real estate. I mean, everyone's kind of diversifying and doing other things. So no one really noticed us for the you know, first one, two. I think 2013 is when the first competitor came around the scene and exactly said whatever we were saying. Uh, the incumbents didn't really still notice, right? Because the guys who are using us were all people who were not putting too much money into the platform because they were not trusting the platform, right? Because in the business of money, credibility is is super important. And when you say you're low cost, people don't trust you at all. You know, so in a trans and like a like I keep giving this example, you know, people will go to, you know, dogfood.com and order dog food for thousand rupees without caring about the credibility of the platform. But they won't go to saveformylife.com and save thousand rupees in a mutual fund because now they want to know if this platform will exist for the next 10 years, 100 years, whatever. Right. So uh, so credibility took us time. I mean, it, it didn't happen you know, uh, we've actually built this business slowly as in, you know, people forget we're we are like a 12 year old business today. You know, a lot of people think, you know, businesses can be built fast. I, I think it's it's almost impossible. So I think competitors really woke up, I think after post Aadhaar, right? Because until Aadhaar happened in 2016, the mode for the competition was you have more branches, you have more relationship managers, you'll do more business, right? That's how broking historically has worked. And that's how banking also historically had worked. But now with Aadhaar, you could open an account online completely, which meant that the mode got broken for the incumbents, right? So all their um, uh, you know, branches and relationship managers suddenly became a technical debt of sorts because they're not needed anymore. Um, I think I think they started waking up only in 2017, 18. And, uh, but it's hard. For, I mean, I know I don't know what I would have done if I was CEO of an incumbent because, I mean, they're almost like, sitting ducks. It's very hard for them to move because, you know, like entire business has been built on a certain pricing model and you can't just get up and change the pricing model uh, unless you decide to say, you know what, I'm okay to go to zero and then grow up again. In in broking like other industries, right? As in uh, your very active traders are the ones who generate revenue for us, uh, for the for the business, right? 10% of the, 10, 15% of the trade uh, customers generate 90, 85, 90% of the revenue. Uh, you know, if you reduce your pricing, you're going to cannibalize your own business, right? As in those 10, 15% are the ones who will quickly move. 
and then you have to you know figure ways to add more business so it, it's it's uh, so yeah so they haven't been able to react of sorts um what have competitors done i mean i think the funniest one was uh, uh, you know in 2012 you know i i had this whole brainwave saying if 2011 you know i had this brainwave saying if we go set up shops in different cities you know maybe credibility will go up you know so uh, we started setting up small little shops but we did like a mega press event and uh, you know uh, because we got press coverage and you know people at least at that point of time i think gave a lot more weightage to what comes in press and people were still reading newspapers so i was in amdavad and i was in the hotel and you know there were this bunch of stock brokers sitting next to me in the restaurant and you know they were talking about zeroda and saying oh you know there's this guy who's coming and doing you know and then they were like dekh lenge kaise kara ga business and, and i'm sitting right next to them you know and i mean i don't think they even knew who i am you know and and uh, um yeah so it's um, I, but it was it's it's actually you know i mean there's net i mean not incumbents didn't really do i mean they keep complaining against us you know every small little thing that we do which is you know little gray as well right i mean exchanges say we they keep you know crying and complaining about it but but it hasn't uh, no i mean nothing nasty of sorts i'm going to ask a question which i think um, cuz most of the times you know the startups world um, as you know about for every 100 startups only two survive and out of which one actually scales and so we get to hear all the good stories about from that one person and nobody hears the failures so i want to ask you in this journey were there things if they had turned differently it would have been extremely difficult for zero that to survive or any slip ups or anything that you could actually bring it out so that people know that this is not all bed of roses you know so, yeah i know i mean i get yeah, i usually get asked this question saying that if you can go back in time what would you change right i mean what are those things i mean i uh, this is something i think about quite a bit and i'm like anything i change in my life i've been so lucky we've been at right place right time so many times that any small change potentially means that i would not be here today right so i'm like you know what i don't want to go back and change anything in my life because you know every screw up has led me you know to kind of be here today so uh, no it's it's i think you know it's just this whole start being being an entrepreneur you know being startup etc is i think um glorified too much you know i think uh, it's not it's not easy to run a business it's not easy to make money i mean i i meet a lot of entrepreneurs who come to me and you know are always looking at hope saying you know what i'm going through tough times is the grass greener on the other side you know like you know in the sense you know as soon as you know as my business becomes successful will i suddenly have peace of mind and will i have everything i think my life has only gotten complicated with success you know i mean i think i enjoyed you know i enjoyed my life a lot more when zero was much smaller you know and um, because today is just you know you 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 come across newer types of obligations right as in um, and when you were smaller no one cared about you as in now everyone cares you know and uh, you know every slip up is now in infinitely more you know uh, issue so you no know, it's it's uh, it's uh, i think i think anyone wanting to start up i think firstly i think you have to find a problem that you're really passionate about right because it's it's a hard journey and if you're not really passionate about the problem it's very tough to stick through it right and um and i think you need to understand that you know luck is super important right i mean this whole i'm going to work hard and grunt my way through it you know it probably helped you to get into imb but not in you know you know not in business you know so right as in you, you need to be extremely lucky you know so you know this whole you can't really predict a, a lot of people claim that you know what like you know i've heard this talk saying you know predict the industry that's growing and go build a business in that industry i mean it, if you can predict it everyone else has predicted and probably already factored in right i mean it's um uh, i think you know a lot of outliers that i've seen a lot of my friends today you know are, are people running startups and it, it's all you know it's all like just, they all generally been very lucky you know not everyone gives enough uh, importance to luck but uh, you know um that luck is a very important factor because you know if you understand that you internalize that you won't feel as frustrated when things don't work out you know because or you know it's very hard to build a you know while building a business so um no i, I mean and uh, what have been the toughest thing it, uh, uh, for me during this journey of zerola is that i think 2017 18 is when we scaled really quickly very fast and uh, and and our, our systems didn't catch up with the scale so we had a bunch of downtimes and you know and in our business um 
if you're down, every minute is a notional PL. You know, if a guy makes profit, he's not going to write to you. But if he makes a loss, he's going to tag finance minister and say, you know, I lost money because of zero. Right. So, and, um, and I think I, I've been, you know, in those times I've been pushed, like, you know, I've, you know, to the edge saying, dude, you know, why am I doing this types? You know, because by then I'd also, you know, made some money that I didn't have to work to maintain my lifestyle. So I, I questioned myself at those times saying, you know, what is the point of doing all of this? And uh, if not for the fact that I'm so passionate about the problem, I think I would have not continued. You know, I would have you know, maybe gotten a CEO or sold sold the business or something like that. You know? So, uh, so yeah. So I think I think uh, finding a problem that you're passionate about. I think the problem today, you know, in the in the in the industry that I see is that people go chasing problems. It doesn't, you know, like it's just that you want to do business just for the heck of doing business, right? As in, and that I I doubt you know will take you too far ahead. You know? See, but Nitin, the uh, I mean, of course, nobody can deny the fact that luck plays a huge fact factor in most people's successes, including I am MBAs. You know, uh, many people don't realize that, but they'll realize it 20, 30 years later. But one thing that did stand out in Zeroda and and your management of that company is choices, some strategic choices that you made along that way. Things like bootstrapping, things like open source technology. Um, so things where I would say this was not a random thing. This was not by luck. It was a conscious decision. And some of them have really been uh, a huge factor behind your success. So how did that work? I mean, when did you decide that this is how you want to separate yourself from the crowd? Yeah, I mean... Uh uh, so yeah, so 2012 is when I think I attended my first startup conference. Uh, this was a GSF event, and you know I was sitting in the audience, and everyone's going cack, mao, dao. I'm like, dude, what's happening? You know, because until then I had not read a business book, or uh, you know, I I didn't really know. I mean, I thought you know a user has to be paying money to open an account. I mean, I didn't realize that you pay people money to open an account. I mean that that I've never understood that concept, right? So so yeah, I was sitting there and. Um, uh, I, I was interacting, I made a bunch of friends um, because the first one, two years, no one really cared about Zerodha, you know, so because firstly, broking wasn't hard. I mean, we were brokers and not fintech, you know, I mean, we became fintech in 2016, 17, but we were essentially doing the same thing, right? So, and the VC community also wasn't very active in 2011, 12. Uh, around 2014 is, I think, when the first VCs reached out. And uh, by then I had made a bunch of friends, you know, from the circuit. And and the realization was that, um, you know, there are two ways to build a business, right? One is you get into a fight of the deepest pocket wins, right? You you raise more money than everyone else and you kind of, you know, you're the last man standing. You know, if you can't beat that, you can probably do well. Um, uh, the other way to do it is make it really hard for the, top, the competition to catch up, you know, in terms of what you're doing philosophically, right? As in, um, and... Um, because of the experience I've had uh, previously with, you know, with being a franchisee or a subbroker of a of a larger broker, I I had kind of also realized that in financial services in a broking business, it's um, it's very hard to do uh, what is right for the investor while not compromising with your customer, right? Because almost. Um, like, for example, you know, as a, as a stockbroker, if I want to generate some revenue, I just need to send a stock tip to all our customer, right? But I cannot send a stock tip to all my customer ethically, right? Because every customer is different, right? There is no one stock tip that'll work for this audience as well. Right? As in, if, 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 you know, if I send a push notification by Reliance Industries, what will a customer do with that stock tip? But it might generate revenue for us, right? So, uh, you know, so I've seen this, I'd seen this happen before, you know, as a stock, as a sub broker, you know, a lot of these brokers, you know, the month end target. So they're pushing notifications or they're selling toxic insurance policies to generate more revenue. Right. Uh, so, so that, that concept was in my head that, you know, it's, it's very hard to please your investor if you end up raising money. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, the choice was that as that if I get investor money in, I'll have to do stuff to grow the business at a certain rate. And if I have to grow the business at a certain rate, I have to compromise with the interest of the customer. If I compromise with the interest of the customer, I have to spend money to acquire users. And if I have to spend money to acquire users, our pricing model doesn't work, right? Uh, the reason the pricing model doesn't work is, see today we have a, you know like 11 million customers, 
if I had spent 5,000 rupees per user, you know, three to 5,000 rupees per user is what our competition spends acquiring the user. If I had spent 5,000 rupees, assume, right, to get uh, 1.1 crore customers, that would be 5,500 crores of rupees, right? And 5,500 crores is all the net profit we've made till date, right? So if that means that, you know, in over the last 10 years, if, if, if we had spent 5,000 rupees acquiring a user, it would not be a profitable business, right? And, and I didn't really think through this much, okay? I mean, the only thing I, th you know, I thought through when, you know, when, we, when VCs came to me was, um, I mean, I personally hate the obligation of picking someone's phone call when I don't want to pick up a call, you know? And, you know, so, uh, and, and I was like, you know, I take his money and then I have to pick up his phone call when he calls me, right? As in, I mean, more, you know, so one was that. And uh, two was also that, um, uh, you know, that I was like, you know, how do I, you know, I take this money, he's expecting to grow the business. How do I grow the business? I didn't really have a clear understanding how I will without, uh, without compromising the interest of the customer. And uh, I think it was okay. I, I think the last one, two years is when, you know, some of these valuations and money they offered was just ridiculous, right? As in, like, you know, Robinhood has a $95 billion valuation. So you're ascribed as a percentage of that. You know, some guys are like, oh, why don't you go buy a plane? Why don't you go buy an island? And I'm like, dude, you know, I mean, I have no such material ambitions, you know? So, uh, yeah, because, you know, I mean, if, if potentially if I had material ambitions in, in my life, you know, maybe I would have done it, you know? But so even that hasn't really played out, you know? I mean, I, I started, uh, you know, trading the markets with all these material goals. And uh, at some point, you know, I just got over it. I was like, dude, What's the point, you know? So and uh, uh, so uh, so yeah. So I mean, open source is actually is all thanks to Kalash, uh, you know, who's our you know CTO and you know he's as much as a co-founder in the business as I am. But he joined us in 2013 and doesn't like to be called a co-founder. Hence, you know, and um, so yeah. So he, uh, you know, again, I met him completely happenstance. He, uh, along with two of his friends from uh, IME, you know, they were building a robo advisory platform. And uh, one of the things I think I've I've done, which is a little smart, and I've done it quite early in my life, was uh, you know I kind of I think 2007 eight I kind of realized that the future belongs to technologists. You know, uh, good people who can build good products are going to be X men of the future. Uh, and if you can't be one, be friends with one. You know, so and so I started putting small amounts of money wherever I had an opportunity to be close to a good technologist. And sensible, you know, where Kalash was the CTO was once at startup. And um, it kind of, you know, that, that whole strategy played out very well because I started in 2007, 8. I met Kalash only in 2013, you know, but in between, I think I had, and I'd invested money when money was hard, you know, in the sense it wasn't you know, just money I could afford to lose, you know, one to five lakh rupees, wherever I had an opportunity, you know, so, and uh, so, yeah, so Kalash and I hit off and uh, uh, Key comes from this whole open source background. And I mean, I think open source is is really the truest form of art, right? As in, you know, where you build something and then you give it away for others to use, right? I mean, I'm I'm still mind blown by you know by what you know the entire open source community does, and I'm like a cheerleader, you know. Every time wherever I go, you know, I'm like saying, you know, what, dude, because the thing about startup industry, industry, startup ecosystem is everyone's built on open source, but no one gives enough credit to it. As in, you know, like. Uh, so yeah, so we've, uh, you know, we've set up, you know, Kalash has set up this thing called as FOSS United to promote FOSS projects. Uh, you know, we are supporting a lot of FOSS projects. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, FOSS, decision of FOSS was him, absolutely. And, but it's played out crazily for us because nothing at Zeroda is enterprise. We don't pay Salesforce, we don't pay Microsoft servers, we don't pay anything, you know, I mean, like uh, the email utility, you know, it's called ListMong, which Kalash built and open sourced. Uh, we send 100 emails, 100 million emails a month, and we, it costs us like $25, right? I mean, if we were using a MailChimp or whatever, you know, I mean, I think we would have spent millions of dollars and, and it's just not emails, you know, I mean, it kind of goes through everything, our CRM, uh, our, um, you know, our back office platform, etc. So we also invested in this company called ERP Next, uh, you know, and I mean, Frappe, who's built this open source utility called ERP Next. So our entire backend of Zeroda is built on ERP Next. And uh, um, so, yeah, so it's, 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 it's crazy. I mean, the other thing that we've done, you know, which kind of hit economies of scale, I mean, I was actually listening to a podcast while coming here 
and you know it spoke about how people overhired in the last 3 4 years because the money was available right uh, so we were at 1100 people on our team at 1 million customers we are a 1100 member on the team with 11 million customers right our we didn't hire not one person on the team i mean now we've just done whatever we can to retain people uh, and so we have hardly had any attrition of sorts and i think one of the things that startup you know people who are building businesses forget to give weightage to is that how money compounds when you you know invest in right places people skill sets also compounds over time right i mean and and what i've seen is a sweet spot is between 2 to 3 years you know then someone joins who spends 2 years 2 to 1 half years he now gets the overall context of the business right and that's when his productivity goes up significantly but if you compare if you look at most startups people quit at 2 to 1 half years right just about the time when they can contribute to the business is when people are leaving you know so and 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 with us you know the fact that no one has quit us till late i mean out of the top 150 maybe four or five people have quit us uh, in the tech team i think two people have left us i mean and not for you know uh, for their own not not because they didn't want the job but they wanted to one had to go out of the country one got married and um, so yeah so i think we've just put all our resources to retain people i think i think yeah these three things you know which is uh, which doesn't really come to the forefront when you look at the business which is not raising capital going open source and just taking care of your team so as much i mean like a family so you can you know just keep them together and motivated um, so i think these three are really the reason why it all turned out to be what it is today amazing story i think we should give them Uh, and at, and I, just to just to give you the context that right, doing open source in financial markets where you know everything is ip you know so it's a fa- fantastic uh, effort and and that's a great story to hear just one last question before we open it up to the audi- audience you started small and you took on the big guys and now you are the big guy so are you having sleepless nights that you know one day somebody younger and more agile will come and take over your <laughs> breakfast yeah no i mean see the thing is i and firstly i don't think of this as competition in the sense i don't think of it as you know number one number two number three you know i mean uh, i don't know why uh, the entire startup circuit is you know always caught up in this i want to be number one number two number three that's because mainly i think because the people who give money give most money to number 1 second most number 2 and then they don't give to anyone else right so so you know there's always this race of you know wanting to be number 1 number 2 but you know now that we are not in that whole i want to raise money from anyone you know i, I don't really care if i'm number 1 or number 2 you know so uh, i'm but that said you know we are extremely competitive we want our product to be way superior than anyone else and we'll go to any extent you know a lot of times i think you know people mistake that aggressiveness is competitiveness right as in if you want to be competitive you have to be loud you have to you know shout at the top of your voice saying you know i'll be the biggest and etc i think you can be competitive just being humble and timid and you know and just you know shut up and you not know, do it all without you know creating any noise you know <laughs> right so uh, no but i think i think uh, you have to do what you have to do where you are at you know i mean if if you have to be loud in iimb to get notice i think you have to do it you know? so uh, but i think uh, when you are doing a business i don't think it's you know uh, it really required yeah but that said um you know i think i think today's world is about the fast beating the slow and not really the big beating the small and uh, Uh, and i think the way i think about zeroda is i keep comparing benchmarking us to the new startups i uh, you know the idea is to be as agile as possible because i know the day we lose that agility is when um, competition will catch up on us in some way or the other so i think where competition will find very hard to catch up on us is one in terms of how agile nimble we are but two which will be even more harder is really around uh catching up philosophically right because the way we think of business the way we think about customer the way we think about money is very hard for competition to catch up because all the competition i mean the founders have in most companies 20 less than 20 25 percent stake 75 percent you know is held by the investors so investors are generally driving the business and investor will do what is right for them right which is unlike to be like i said earlier right for the customer right and um Uh, and and as a business you know if you don't do what's right for the customer it's hard to eventually you know keep growing it you know right so uh, so that's how we were thinking you know we we're thinking um, uh, i mean see when we started zeroda the the idea was 
I want to make life of a trader easier, as in, in the sense we wanted traders to pay lesser costs. And yeah, sorry. Yeah, so uh, it, it it kept evolving. Uh, uh, today, the business is about, you know, uh, all of us in the business today, the question we ask is, the reason we exist is because we need our customers to do better with the money, right? As in, if what's the point of all of this if our customers don't do well with the money? And uh, and everything that we are doing today as a business is, you know, with the idea that we want to help our customers do better uh, because we exist. Because otherwise, there is no point of being existing as a business, you know, and um and yeah so i mean the business has evolved like that and and uh, and and i think i think you know i think there are very few competition who's thinking like us so i think that is that's uh, really an edge or a mode for us as a business thank thank you nitin so let's now open it up so please guys if you are having a question raise your hand we will send a mic to you yeah why don't you like shall do we have a mic that we can pass around yes yeah so a lot of people are raising so you can yeah. Yeah. My question is, uh, you said in 2017, you scaled the fastest. So what were the conscious steps that you took? Was something happened? Oh, no, I mean, uh, we scaled, you know, when I say we scaled the fastest, we just got lucky, you know, in the sense that was really the first run of the bull market. So like, uh, see, the thing is, Aadhaar account opening started in 2016. So we were at 60,000 customers when we started with Aadhaar account opening. Um, and then we went from 60,000 customers to 4 lakh customers very quickly because of that Aadhaar account opening, which meant you could open accounts quickly, right? And uh, but but the infra couldn't catch up with that, you know. So uh, uh, so, so yeah, it was not like a conscious. I don't think we ever started a business. You're saying we want to grow this much, you know. I mean, we've always like every day we get up and say, you know what, we need to get better as a business. But there has never been a target. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe this goes against what you thought in business school, but you know, we have never gotten, a, you know, we have never started a year saying, you know, I want to grow at this much or I want this target. And because the way I think of it is that as soon as you put target, you know, you optimize for that target and, um, and potentially, you know, you compromise on some decisions, right? So, uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, so we didn't really plan the scale any, any, any time, you know, I mean, uh, it just happened. So. Yeah, but Aadhaar was also like, it's lack of awareness, right? Did you do campaigns, etc. to make no, the awareness? I mean, not really. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just people who came to our website just open, you know, were able to open accounts faster. And then you know, when they realized they can op open accounts faster, they spoke to their friends and family. And see, I think in today's world, right? I mean, I, I don't know how many of you are doing marketing, you know, of course, yeah, but, you know, but, but yeah, the, you know, I, I always question this. Uh, efficacy of marketing and advertisement you know like like um, if you have a good product and you're also advertised like for example uh, i think google uh, gave us like some 20 25000 rupees in credit and when they gave us in credit you know i mean that's the only time we ran google adword campaign and we ran for our own keyword right which is what everyone does right as you search for zero then you know, some of our competition was quoting on our keyword and so we said you know what at least let's use this 25000 rupees for this and we ran it for a week and made no difference you know i mean we were trying to see does it does it show a bump in leads does it show some you know like incremental increase it didn't you know so uh, so yeah so i'm i come from the school of thought that you know if you have a decent product um, and you know if if you found a good product market fit um um in a business like ours where you know it's it's mostly because see no one looks at an ad and decides to trade the markets Right. You might decide to buy a mobile phone, buy a pizza, buy a samosa, whatever, right? Looking at ad, right? Because, you you know, if Shah Rukh Khan's dancing, you're not going to open a trading. Okay, assuming you open a trading account, what will you do next, right? As in, <laughs> I mean, you know, so I mean, you won't decide to buy Infosys stock because Shah Rukh Khan's dancing. I mean, it's, it's not really possible. And uh, and also the other thing is that uh, regulators are very clear that when you're, when you're doing any advertising, there can't be any greed sold in any way, right? Now, if you can't sell greed, uh, if you if you could sell greed, I think marketing and advertising for our industry is just brilliant. You know, I mean, you know, if if you could go and say what crypto guys were saying for like two years, I mean, I think you know our industry also would have grown as much, right? You know, uh, because I know I remember looking at ads saying you can never lose money. You know, like come back in two years and the price will be this much higher than this. You know, I'm, I'm you can't do stuff like that in uh, you know in a regulated business. So yeah, so if you can't do stuff like that and uh, and you know. Uh, you know, uh, you need, you know, trading accounts 
opening a trading account gives you no business. A lot of people over the last one, two years who have raised VC funds, right? I spent shitloads of money uh, opening trading accounts. Uh, but the trading account is not, you know, resulting in revenues, right? Hasn't resulted in AUM. So what is the point of opening so much trading account by spending so much money? I mean, it, it made no sense at all. So uh, I think one of the things that we are most proud at Zeroda is that it's not that we have 1.1 crore customers, but today we have two and a half lakh crores of customer assets with us. Right. And India, I think we're just behind ICICI, right? Uh, and ICICI took like 30 years to build that trust. Right? Because if, if two and a half lakh crores is lying in Zerodas demand accounts, that means people have trusted us with that much money, right? And um, and 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 most of our competition are are like tiny percentages of that, you know. So um, so yeah, so when you do stupidity, right, your customer who has to build trust, right? I mean, I think he also questions saying, dude, why is he doing the stupidity, right? As in, why is he paying, giving a t-shirt free of cost to open a trading account when, you know, I'm probably not going to do anything, right? I mean, would you trust your hard-earned money in that platform is a question. So we are the only brokers who have charged account opening fees over the last 12 years. We haven't given anyone free accounts because I was like, you know, I want to filter out people who are not serious about the business. You know, opening a trading account is is a serious business. You know, it's not you know, installing Zynga poker and playing, you know, poker with fake money, right? I mean, so, you know, asking money from the user is like setting a seriousness right at the start saying, dude, I, if you want to open an account with me, I want to know you're serious about trading and investing and, and not doing it just for fun's sake, you know? So, uh, so yeah, so, I mean, I think, I mean, like I said, you know, I don't know how much of this is luck and how much is of, of this is really, you know, all our thinking that has helped us till now, but, but this is how we thought. You're about. convincing though. <laughs> So oh, yeah, it is just on it. <laughs> he should say he should have said that first. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, so the thing is, um, so one of those conscious decisions we have made as a business was is that is not to offer everything a customer asks for, right? You know, because uh, it just complicates the hell out of your business, right? Because, uh, you know, I, you know, and I, when I started the business, I had this thing, I want to please every customer. So we want to build every, I would answer every customer who sent me a, you know, like a, like a feedback, right? I would take a note of it. I put it on my to-do list and say, you know what, we need to do this stuff, you know? So, and then soon I realized it's, it's actually, you know, just, just a waste of time. You know, I'm kind of bouncing my team around these random things. Uh, so at some point of time, I just said, you know what, we think we know what our customers need. And we will do whatever best we can to offer what we think is required by the customer. Of course, you know, we take feedback once in a while and if we have not realized, but we're not trying to do everything a customer is asking for because one of the problems here of building everything and building fast, et cetera, is, you know, you build technical debt, right? And this is, and, and this is something that comes to bite you as you start scaling, right? So the, you know, I spoke about the first back office vendor, right? Uh, the guy who gave it to me for free of cost. I had thought in my head that, you know, there's a shit platform. I'm going to use it for one, two years. As soon as I, you know, make some money, I'm going to switch out of it. It took us nine years to do it, right? Because it just, you know, it just, you know, that decision of doing it for the free, I mean, we could not have started Zerola without that. So I'm grateful to him. But the fact is, uh, it just kept building. The technical debt kept building that, you know, at some point of time, we were like, dude, how do we stop this? As in, how do we stop and start something else? You know, as you become bigger, those decisions that you take to just build randomly, build too many things, it all come back, comes back to bite. You're building very fast. I think some of the competition, not just what you mentioned, others as well, I think are, are trying to... See, the thing is, the way to beat Zeroda today is just to add a lot more features, right? I mean, in, in people, because, you know, pricing, there is no more play, right? I mean, so people think that, you know what, if I just add like a lot more features, maybe some customers will move out, right? Like, and add every single feature in town. But I think that this being very short-sighted because, uh, you know, it works if you have 10,000 customers, it may not work at 1 million customers, right? So uh, so you just kind of hit a, hit a point where, you know, all those decisions will come back to bite you. So, I mean, that's how I think, um, but, um, but yeah, um, you know, I might, I might be wrong as well. <laughs> all right. 
Uh, let me ask somebody from this side. Yeah, the lady at the back. Do you have a mic? Um, can somebody get her a mic fast? Hi, Nitin. My name is Sally. I've come from Pune. Uh, you spoke of uh, regulatory foresight. So um, I have uh, two questions, basically. Uh, startups generally have a resistance towards uh, embracing uh, regulations. Um, so uh, what do you think is the secret to embracing uh, regulations? And uh, do you think that uh, doing so has sort of created a competitive advantage for Zeroda? And how can new startups also sort of, uh, you know, do the same, no matter what the business and speaking, my second question is speaking of foresight, uh, what are your thoughts on crypto? Uh, what is the future of crypto? I do not see any signs of zero that are really leaning into it. So what do you think? That, that's the answer. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, crypto is straightforward. Uh, I, I don't think we've understood what crypto is or are we have maybe we're not cared for you know, trying to understand what crypto is because we know that until there are explicit guidelines and regulations from the regulator, we would never venture into it. You know, there are so many of the crypto exchanges in India who came to us and said, you know what, why don't you come on as an advisor? We'll give you a stake, et cetera. You know, and we're like, you know, I, I want to be like 500 meters away from you guys. And until, until there are absolute clear regulations around it, you know, so, uh, so yeah, zero, zero exposure in crypto and, and we will not take any until, uh, you know, government and regulators put something out there. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, having a regulatory foresight saying that we are a large player in the market and taking exposure to something which is not regulated shows our regulatory intent. Like, you know, in the sense, the fact that a founder of a company is okay taking exposure into something which has no regulatory blessings, where potentially a lot of fraud, Ponzi schemes and all of that is happening, right? It kind of, you know, validates that product, right? As in, in the sense, you know, if I invest into a, a into into a product which is, I mean, a crypto platform which is selling Ponzi schemes, in a way, I'm vouching for it, right? As in, now, if I didn't have the regulatory foresight, I might have said, you know what, zero cost, zero downside. You know, I'm not investing any money. They're going to give me one two percent stake, um, just to be an advisor. Maybe I don't have to advise them as well, right? As in, if I thought it only in terms of money, I would have probably done it, right? But, but the fact that knowing, you know, if, if you were to think of the worst case outcome, um, what if I'd say, you know, FTX was in India and I was an investor in it and it blew up and Sebi calls me up tomorrow and says, Nitin, why were you on this platform? You know, why were you an investor? Why were you an advisor to this platform? And, and, and why were you keeping quiet when whatever was happening, right? As in, that would probably potentially have been like, you know, catastrophic for the business of sorts. So, uh, so you no, know, absolutely right. It's just uh, at every point of time, any new product we build, we've always constantly questioned, saying, "How can regulations change in the future?" And what we are doing is, does it go along with how regulations will change in the future? For example, one uh, you know one of the big regulatory changes in the last two years was around you know intraday leverages that stockbrokers can offer. Right. That means you know if you have one lakh rupees in your account, a stockbroker until last year could allow you to trade buy stuff for one crore rupees, right? Uh, or hundred crores. There was no limit. There was no regulation which said you can't offer, right? But it kind of was, it was obvious that you cannot use one person's money to fund another customer. So the way brokers were doing was, if you had one lakh rupees in your account sitting idle and there were four other people, uh, uh, I mean, you, you wanted to trade for five lakh rupees and you had only one lakh rupees and four other people had one lakh rupees in their account, a stockbroker could take the entire five lakh rupees and allow, allow you to trade on it. Right. This was like a regulatory gray thing, but it was not in the spirit of regulation. So we never did it, you know, right from when we started the business, we said we will only allow a customer exposure to the extent of money belongs to him. Or if we have some extra money, if we can fund him, we will fund him that. Right. And um, so a lot of our competitors build their business modes around saying, you know what, Zeroda doesn't give you unlimited exposure. I will give you unlimited exposure. Why don't you come use me? Right. And it, it worked well for seven, eight, nine years, but the day regulations came and didn't allow for it, most of these guys have lost like 40, 50% of their revenues in terms of the business from the time the regulations came, right? So it was a hard call to make. Uh, like one of those things that I'm constantly pushed on now is around margin funding. Margin funding is essentially, you know, when a guy comes to the, you know, on an order screen, you want to buy 10 shares of Reliance. 
but a lot of our competitive platform says, you know what, why, if you want to buy 10 shares of Reliance, why don't you buy 50, 40, I will give you a loan, you know, at 15% per year or whatever, right? They're trying to trigger your greed to get you to trade more, right? I think I can build thousand crores of revenues doing this tomorrow morning, right? And we have, you know, we have, we have said no for this over the last two, three years, because we think it's a shit product for the customer because you know, most most people in this, you know, most people out there who are, who are investors shouldn't be taking leverage, right? I mean, when they're buying investing because they don't know, you know, uh, what leverage is. And also in the stock markets, if you make 15% compounded, you've done an amazing job, right? Now, if you get, if you borrow money at 15%, you invest in the markets, how are you going to make money, right? As in, it's, it's just a no brainer. I mean, so yeah, so we've, we've said no to this business and I know we are losing out on revenues, but I think there's the right thing to do as a business. And and I know that one of these days, you know, regulator will wake up and say, you know, hey, you all of you boys who are doing this, I mean, why were you doing this? You know, I mean, did you do a product market fit? I mean, why were you selling this product to every single person out there? So, you know, I think I think it's helped significantly at every I mean, it's a delayed gratification. I mean, it doesn't, you know, like you don't instantly get a bump up because you're sticking to regulations. But um, the regulatory environment around the world is actually changing very fast. If you're, you know, if you're building business in the spirit of regulations, I think you get a bump up every time the regulatory change happens. I mean, you don't know when it happens, but when every time it happens, you get like two, three legs on your competition. You know, so. No, I think this is a fantastic uh, lesson for startups. I don't know how many startups are here, uh, especially when you are in a regulatory front business. Uh, you have to plan for regulation change. Otherwise, if your business model is based on current regulation and regulations change, it's like a rug pull being pulled out of your feet. So no way you will survive. So let's, uh, yeah. So the gentleman there, you have a mic or you can, perfect, perfect. Yeah, so I mean, see, the thing is, the last two, three years have been just stupid. You know, I mean, like, I'm, you know, I, I still get up and think, you know, why are we making so much money as a business? You know, so, like, I mean, this is, this is a question we ask internally, like, you know, dude, why? Why is the why is there you know so much business being gen you know, so much profits being generated for a business like us you know so I think we are in the middle of excesses and it'll correct itself over the next one two three years you know and um, because you know we've had this whole new generation of people coming to the markets thinking they can somehow uh, trade actively and make money I mean they're gonna get disappointed at some point of time and they get disappointed you know they will the trading activity is just gonna drop you know so uh, so the way we've thought about it is that. Now, we've just tried to keep our margins. You know, we have like like a seventy five percent gross margin on the uh, on uh, you know, and uh, and we have like a fifteen sixteen year runway right now as a business. You know, so so the way I'm thinking is, you know, to, you know, if if you know if shit hits the fan, you know, I mean, we need to survive three four years. I mean, we have enough to survive, right? So uh, so yeah, so you're absolutely right. I think uh, uh, regulator, I don't think really wants too many people actively trading the markets. You know, which is our prime bread butter jam, you know, because people buying and selling quickly is what generates revenue for the business. Um, and we are also trying to pivot out of it as a business. You know, uh, we are saying you cannot, I mean, it was okay when, you know, you know, we started this way, but today our job is, is to kind of help people do better with money. So I think the future of Zeroda is, I think, you know, we're going to slowly start pivoting into advisory saying you don't have to, you know, we have one crore investors so, you know, even if you make small amounts of money from an investor in some form, and if you can help him do better with the money, maybe there is some money to be made there, right? So, you know, now you kind of hit that, you know, that that captive audience at which, you know, you can kind of experiment with some other verticals as well. But uh, but internally as well, I've told that maybe this year's, uh, I mean, last year, this year, I don't think we're going to hit the profitability that we're going to hit last year, this year, in the next three, four, five years. You know, it's, it's really hard as in, uh, I mean, I think we've been public about our financials. I mean, we made like, I think like 1,800 crores last year of profits, like net profits. So, I mean, it's impossible to kind of, you know, we grew it, we've been growing it like 100% year on year for a long time. Uh, I think this year we'll end up doing maybe around the same as last year, but but I, I see that tapering off. You know, I mean, already the interest in the markets are tapering off. The last two, three months, you know, I mean, the whole euphoria around trading, investing, et cetera, is dropping off. 
so um, yeah so i mean we are kind of building some other um, i mean this whole advisory is uh, especially with account aggregator framework coming through uh, we believe that if if a person could with one click share all of his financial details there is a advisory opportunity out there right um, and and you know is is something that you know we we are trying to attempt we applied for an amc license i think we will be a mutual fund in, in the next 2 3 months we have an nbfc you know where we don't talk about it much uh, but we have a loan against securities business uh, uh, you know secure you know because it's securitized uh, you can borrow money at 10 and a half percent so uh, so that piece of business is there and uh, and yeah but but you, but you're right i think i think broking is going to be more challenging in terms of generating profits and revenue in the future sure. yeah next yeah. yeah no i mean see the thing is uh i think the us i mean i think india is at least i think 20 years ahead of the us in terms of our market infrastructure in terms of regulations etc and in india right uh, i think the reason it is this way is because there is no lobbying as such i mean there is no broker lobby you know who's going to go meet ministers and say you know what regulations have to change you know almost every regulation that sebi wanted to put out it has put out i mean of course brokers have cried but that's all they've done i mean they just cried you know on social media on news you know news channels etc i mean there is no there's no lobbying power you know but in the us it works differently right i mean you can actually lobby you know some of these regulations and uh, and that's how i think i think this whole payments for order flow which is when a customer comes to your platform sending their order to a hedge fund i mean i think it's the most conflicted most disgusting kind of practice out there i mean i have no i mean i don't know if you guys know this this was actually started by bernie madoff right he was the first guy who started offering brokers saying you know what i'll give you money why don't you send me the order flow right i mean that was the whole thing was popularized by him so i don't think sebi uh, you know india will ever go back to you know go to that that level where saying brokers can somehow sell the order flow to uh like a hedge fund or whatever for money i i mean it's it's a disgusting practice i i mean if if i am around the scene i'm going to you know even if someone decides to do it i'm going to oppose it significantly you know so yeah all right yeah uh nitin uh, i wanted to know like you have created a ecosystem around all your product like beat small case or now the a bond trading platform so a lot of uh, products are there but uh, very few products where we are seeing like cross selling is happening like if you go to financial service industry everyone is doing cross sell why you are not following that suit like is there anything that against the principles like what yeah what i mean this is one of those philosophical decisions you know which is i think one of the one of the things you know like our decision framework at zeroda is we will not want to do something to a customer which we don't want done to us right i mean i don't like random spam emails i don't write like random spam notifications so i'm not going to do it to a customer right i mean it's it's as simple as that i mean if you uh, we have sent 12 push notifications in the last one year i think our competition probably sends 12 in a day you know some of them you know so you know so and um, and and like i said i mean there's there's a there is a it's not like we're doing just out of i think it's also a competitive edge the ability to be able to say and do this also gives us a moat of sorts on the competition right so yeah and and the and the and the, and the thing about rain matter when we first started up rain matter fintech was uh we we had you know we said you know what all these moon shots that you want to take uh you know in terms of building niche platforms and niche ideas we said we don't want to attempt everything uh we will focus on the core offering and we'll partner with startups to you know and collaborate for everything else uh and that that has really played out really well because every single thing right be it small case be it sensible be it streak be it all of these you know each of these businesses we could have potentially built it in house right as in you know in a lot of these cases the idea was seeded through us you know i mean we found a team and we said you know what thematic investing is a good idea we said options trading is a good you know platform where you kind of push option strategies is a good idea right um so we seeded the idea we funded them you know they build themselves but uh, that doesn't mean that you know i should push it to our customers when customers haven't asked us to be pushed you know so and where you are spending your most of the time like uh, i know like zeroda 
uh, it's on autopilot mode like any company that oh, uh, is your I mean, page what, i mean i wish it was an autopilot you know i mean you know so like i said you know the grass is not greener on the other side you know? so it's 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 not on autopilot mode you know and uh, you know there is i think today is just at the at the scale we are at you know the challenges have changed you know i'm I, i'm doing random meetings 3 4 days 3 4 times a day uh, you know and and i can't say no to some of these as well so um, it's not autopilot but but one of the things i'm very excited about is uh, is is around the rain matter foundation that we have set up and uh, and there you know we we you know alloc- we allocated like 100 million dollars to start with we have deployed around 350 400 crores in the last one up to years supporting startups i mean for profits and not for profits working around climate and creation of livelihood and uh, while it's out of my core competency you know so i can't really decide which to invest which not to invest uh, you know there's a team behind it today and uh, but i find it very fulfilling you know in the sense you know it's like a conscious check mo- check box right like a tick or every time we invest in support something you know so i sleep better of sorts so uh, but it's it's a lot more fulfilling but i don't think i'm i'm giving as much time there but i'm slowly learning you know uh, over the last one two years you know just hanging around people and just listening to people um uh, because my gut and instincts work very well for capital markets it's still not working well for climate and you know and you know in this space actually you have a long time though <laughs> so Nitin. yeah yeah one sec yeah, yeah. Huh? Uh, no it's i think it'd be useful for the people watching yeah Hey Nathan, you mentioned you want to run away 500 meters when we talk about cryptos. What is your thought about NFTs and future of NFT in Indian market? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think yeah, NFT is like a derivative on crypto. I think, uh, but uh, so yeah, so I mean, I would be even further away, you know, of sorts. Yeah, no, but like I said, I think at least uh, I know because I have a few artist friends, and who told me some use cases of NFTs. You know, I mean. Um, uh which seems at least you know something that i can understand if tomorrow you know the world to be available um but but yeah but right now you know stay as far away as possible <laughs> nitin last question yeah yeah so i want to uh, know about few pointers from you uh, your end uh, on invest with working on uh, without investment like you uh, built your empire without investors helping you out so few pointers on that like uh, new founders like us take something from that <laughs> yeah no see the thing is uh, one of the qualms i have with the startup ecosystem is you know while is that i think it's impossible today to build a bootstrap business you know so i i think like today as we stand in 2020 2021 20 whatever 22 sorry i mean yeah you know so <laughs> right <laughs> yeah so covid has just made this whole 2020 onwards like the same you know so yeah no i think i think it's 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 almost impossible to build a boots like if zeroda has to start all, all, all over today it's impossible to build zeroda bootstrap and because it's become so hard to hire people it's become so expensive to you know get an idea to mvp right doesn't you need like a million dollars just to be able to do it unless of course you are a technologist and you can build everything yourself right so uh, so yeah so i i think i think today it's it's impossible to do it Uh, i think the only thing i i usually advise entrepreneurs starting off is that uh, you know if you're raising money don't oversell right because you know once you oversell to your investors you have to stick to what you have sold right and and this is a problem you know i meet a lot of these startups from capital markets who come to me and say india will have 40 crore indians investing in 5 years and i'll be like dude what are you smoking i'm mean, like <laughs> you know i mean come on you can't be saying that to me right <laughs> you know so uh, and uh, So yeah, so I think I think um, even if it's harder to raise money, I think it's a good idea to undersell when you are raising money because then the investor expectations is set right, right? Uh, because if you set the investor expectation wrong, then you are forced to run a business, you know, probably different way than what you would have otherwise run. Uh, I think uh, I think the second thing is is to also set expectation right for your team. Uh, I think um, because you are unlikely to be able to have. you know be able to retain people just by paying them more money if you haven't raised you know as much capital right or you know if you haven't created like valuation out of your business then it's hard to retain people so you have to set expectations right so uh, and and be you know extremely picky about whom you select to be part of your team you know so i think uh, you know one of the things we have done right is that uh, uh, you know we only had people who really associated with the problem 
statement and and two is we have never there was never esau promise to a cus in anyone who joined us or we never said i'll pay you 40% more than your previous salary join us you know i mean it is never those conversations have never happened not one in the last whatever once in the last 5 years has anyone comes to me and come to me and said nitin i want a you know like a hike in salary or otherwise i'll leave you know i mean stuff like that hasn't happened and that's because you set the expectations right at the start right and um, and then it becomes easy for you to beat it you know so and if you set like a high benchmark then it becomes really hard to beat it and then these people you know get disappointed and if they get disappointed you know they probably you know going to leave or you know uh, or not going to give as much effort as a business you know so i think i think it's this whole undersell undersell over deliver is 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 really i think the right way to go about it especially if if you're going to take the route of saying i'm not going to raise as much money because like i said i think it's impossible to build today a business without raising capital you know so. um i'm going to end with one last question um sorry guys i mean if it's a short question i'll let you ask yeah i'll hold you yeah i mean yeah i mean i kind of broadly you know i mean i vaguely i got the question you know so so the thing is firstly i think this whole market size is i think is you know is kind of is a wrong story being sold uh you know in the sense in india we had 5 crore indians who filed income tax returns last year right assuming you know there are three times more people who can potentially invest in the market it's 15 crores right out of 15 crores 9 crore people have a account open and 3 and 1/2 crore people have actively traded once the last year so on 15 crore population if you look at 4 or 5 crores that's almost like a 20 30% penetration now 20 30% penetration is not bad you know it's it's actually quite good right of course you know if you believe in the story that all the 150 crore indians can invest i mean i i'll have to ask you what are you smoking you know so <laughs> you know so you know because you know a guy was making 100 rupees a day isn't going to have enough money to be able to save invest uh, you know in the future no but but that said you're right as in um um education is really the key i mean and and this is something that we are attempting quite hard we believe that you know education on markets and finance has to happen in school and colleges and not really people figuring it out on their own after once they have their job because today what happens is you finish your college you get out of your college you meet a bunch of friends you end up picking whatever they are pick, doing right and then uh, or you end up picking what your parents did right and um, yeah one of the other things we we exist as a business in our head is you know we want to help india financialize because that would mean more indians will take risks uh if more indians take risk it becomes more easier for indian entrepreneurs to raise money locally if if indian entrepreneurs can raise money locally wealth creation happens locally and then then we get wealthy as a country inclusively you know i mean and and not you know wealth creating you know getting created outside india and uh and and a few people within india you know so i mean that's how we think about all of this nitin one last question for this audience which is largely students what is your advice to them because many of them as i mentioned to you outside they all is going to join consulting firms and and the usual you know set of companies um what would be your advice to them just as students coming out of a college as well as opportunities in the financial markets yeah i mean i i think i have a you know conflict of interest now i mean i i think if you know i i i'm really bothered about the brain drain you know i mean i i i hope you guys all stay in india i mean uh, you know number one you know so right because uh, you know i think for the country to become wealthy like i said earlier you know i mean you need wealth to be created here right i mean if you are just going to think about yourself and you know just try to make maximum roi for yourself and i mean maybe it's not fair to the country you know which is given you the opportunity you know so um, so yeah so first maybe stay in the country and two is i think i think there's like i believe uh, as i said i might be conflicted saying this but i think india is at the center of the earth right now and right? i mean we have a stable government we are the 
largest democracy. We have the highest number of 20 to 30 year olds, a lot of capital chasing India. So I think, you know, if you're in India, I think opportunities will show up. You know I mean, uh, and if you're thinking of doing a business, I think let the opportunity come to you and not, don't go, you know, like, a, you know, don't go holding a hammer trying to find a nail, you know, because, uh, you know, you know, getting stuck in a wrong business is almost like getting stuck in a bad marriage, you know, very hard to get out of it. <laughs> thank, thank you, Nitin. Let's give him a hand. I think um, it's been a wonderful one hour session with him and I hope, you guys took some nuggets of wisdom from his 15-year uh, journey. And um, thank you. We have a small memento. So, Vaishali, you have something to say? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, with this, we would like to thank Nitin for sparing his valuable time and sharing his words of wisdom. And obviously, Professor Venki for organizing this discussion for us. We have Riti Advani with us from CCMRM, Center for Capital Market and Risk Management. And she'll be helping us with the memento presentation. Yeah. Thanks, Nitin. And um, again, we have uh, we have had this opportunity. Hopefully, you know this is something that will spur some of you guys to think differently about your future. And uh, one more time, thank you for coming. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. Was that okay? Yeah, no. He knows.